time with Herman and Sharon. Okay, let's find Here out. Here we are. Let's find it takes out. Takes a while to get out of the house. <laughs> let's find out who our guests today. I cannot wait yes. for this interview, honey. I know, I'm so excited why, too. So why are we standing here? I don't know, I don't know why. <laughs> we need to go sit down and meet him okay. right now. <laughs> here is my guest today. His name is Reverend... Try it. <laughs> I, hey I don't want to mess it up. Hey Sam Bismarck. Hey Sam. Hey Sam. Hey Sam. Like hey Sam. Hey Sam. Hey Sam. Hey. <laughs> His testimony, you will not, will not believe it. Okay, and this is his wife. She's got an easy name, Lori. Lori, yeah. <laughs> yeah straightforward name. Yeah. That's change. right. That's now, right. you were born and raised where? In Damascus. Damascus, Syria. Wow. Wow, that's great. So you know exactly what's happening in that city right now, right? Unfortunately. Goodness gracious. When, yes, you, when you see video, do you? I know all the areas, uh, everything, whatever. I was there for 70, the first 17 years of my life. Wow. Herman, why don't you sit down and I was talk to I was just going <laughs> to yeah. ask you that. Yeah, so. please do. <laughs> Feed at home. Yeah, I got I to gotta show you the gig. Hey, Dave, can you, this is my director back there. I, I drive him crazy. Look at look at this cart. See this right here? Uh, you know, I, I don't know if I can lift you, it up. If see, you want to try it, you see, can try it. See, he, this is how he came in. Okay, he's got <laughs> he's got one knee that he puts on this, and then then he rolls with it. Yeah, but tell, <laughs> tell, tell, he needs to tell us why it, this guy, happened. Yeah, he, he, he does what I love. Okay, he trains horses, and, and, and he loves horses, and you're from Ocala, that, that area, yes, sir. where is a horse area for Florida. Sit it's down, supposed Herman. to be for the old, <laughs> actually. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> okay, wh what happened? Um, we have a horse, an, an Egyptian Arabian, straight Egyptian Arabian horse that we are selling off, and I wanted to make sure he's safe, good, everything is, is good with him before we move him on to sell him. And I worked with him on the ground for uh, about 45 minutes. Everything was perfect. Put a Western saddle as a mistake because normally I ride English, but I decided to put Western saddle. I'm a on Western him. saddle guy. That's okay. You could. <laughs> there is room for improvement. <laughs> <laughs> so I got on, and everything was perfect until I sat on, and he suddenly moved from wo from standstill, three steps in canter, and then went bronco with the twisting back forth. And it just, I lasted as long as I could. Thinking. What are you thinking? Because you're, you're a trained guy. I, I was thinking I could control it until it, when they start doing the Bronco, they have, they've lost ability to see around them. Ah. They go, it doesn't matter what they hit, any, it doesn't matter, it's irrelevant. Because so their the, brain is, is... Their brain is frozen because wow. they're, they're trained, they're a flight animal. Because yeah. They, they're not trained to yeah, face yeah. danger, they're trained to run away from it. Yes. So something triggered him and he started going through tree branch, to, to a one of our tree branches, and I decided I'm not gonna wait until I see it on me or on him. I don't wanna kill the horse, I'm gonna get off. And I'm, I, as much as I've been on horses, I know how to jump off. Yeah. But my shirt got stuck on the little horn in the front. And that my crazy foot got western stuck. saddle. Yes. <laughs> And my foot got stuck, and it was a hassle because he was twisting and turning and jumping with arch back, and I was trying to depart. So my foot got stuck. When I landed, I knew I, I, I broke my, my, my leg. Oh. So. Were you there, Lori? Yes, I was there. She you was watching it all. <laughs> you saw it happening? <laughs> wow. wow. That you were afraid, right? Okay. Uh, let, let me just, uh, Dave, get a shot of, of, of uh, say the name again. Heisem. Heisem? Yeah. There you go. Hi, sir. Mm -hmm. There's always a challenge. And, and what did you say? You say it like? Haysom. Haysom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Reverend Haysom. Listen to this. They're always got a good picture of you. Uh, he's an international economist with over 20 years of success in finance and economy, uh, development with proven achievements in uh Economies in Dubai, Czech Republic, Russia, Middle East, wow. Far East, Africa, and Europe. This includes implementing uh, human social services and aid programs in underdeveloped countries. After 50 years of uh, devotion in Islam, he was saved by the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, of Nazareth, it's amazing how all of this he puts out there, uh, 
when he was told by two hospitals that he had no chance of living. Today, he is a certified pastor with the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. I like that Cleveland, Tennessee yeah. Church of God. And serving the Lord full time. I thought it was the only one Church of God. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. That's but uh, you have got to tell, I mean, born in Syria, he moved mm -hmm. to U New York in 2000. And uh, I mean, with all of his education, with all of his brain power, and all of your ability in finance, you moved to New York, No sat that was in 2000, no satisfaction, went through a divorce, had three children, paid the price for all of that, and then you married again, Lori, in 2008. Start from there. Start from the marriage? Or? Yeah. Okay. Well, th my first marriage was a disaster. I lived until I was 17 in Damascus, and then I moved to England where I did my, higher edu my education university and higher education and all my work from there. When I came to the U.S., I went to New York to work for the United Nations to consult for them, wow. and I decided it wasn't something I would like to do. It, it, it wasn't anything I w that would fit to my criteria. At the age of 38, I thought, well, you know, I need a more honest lifestyle rather than politics and the lies that comes with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So That's I decided right. it wasn't for me and I moved away. Then I was introduced to my ex-wife whom I thought, well, you know, I'm old, she doesn't look good, so that makes a good combination. She won't have affairs on me because as a Muslim, your biggest struggle would be if I marry a, a Western girl is going to have an affair on me, which is what you see in the video, uh, on TV and the cinemas wow. and all of this. Mm. I understand that's why they have that covering all the time. Uh, so no, nobody, that's a different thing. Oh, that's cultural. Okay, all right, gotcha. That, that's cultural. I thought that maybe that so, so a guy wouldn't be, uh, you know, uh, thinking I'd like to go with her. No, 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 no nothing to do with that. Okay. That's tr culture that made it, in, tradition made it into the religion. Okay, mm -hmm. continue. So Sorry I interrupted. Oh, no, that's fine. You could do that. It's your show. <laughs> <laughs> but we're here because of you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So I, the marriage lasted four years. Even at the wedding day, I had a check in my spirit that I should run. This is not for me. And wow. I thought, what am I going to tell all the guests? And you were a full-fledged Muslim? I was a full-fledged Muslim. And so was Muslim. she? No, she, she's from the U.S. Okay. She doesn't believe in God. She okay. believes God is a woman. Okay. <laughs> but that wasn't, that's another okay. subject. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So the marriage lasted four years, and it, it was not an easy one. And you had children. And I had three children. I still have three children. But I wasn't going to break the marriage because the children meant too much to me, mm -hmm. and they still do. So then when the marriage broke uh, for various vicious circumstances, I decided I was never going to marry again, ever. No woman is going to do it for me until I met my <laughs> wife, Lori. And we were just friends through horses. She was riding. So you, you're a horse person too? Mm -hmm. Wow. So we decided, you know, um, um, we met at an Eid party, which is a celebration after Ramadan breaks. She was working for a medical uh, practice. I was invited by a friend who hosted it because I was on the steering committee of Providence Hospital in, in Michigan. And I was invited to the party, not because I was a Muslim, just because I was a friend. And mm -hmm. that's where we met. And we had nothing in common other than horses. And no woman is going to do it for me. And, and then slowly and gradually, I felt it in my spirit, this is the woman for me. But I wasn't going to do anything because I'm too scared to do the same mistake again. Sure. And then we got married. And we got married on horseback in a park. That is <laughs> neat. <laughs> that, so what did you think when you first met? Oh, I had gotten divorced five years earlier. That's how I came to know the Lord. I was happy by myself. I didn't need anybody. I went to this Eid party. I didn't want to go to the Eid party. I went because I had to. I walked in. I wanted to eat and leave. And so the host gave me the food. I, I was standing and eating as fast as I could so I could get out of there. And he was sitting at the table and he said, you can sit down. I thought, oh, no. <laughs> so I sat down and he struck up a conversation with me. And, and I'm he answering. can talk. He can talk, yes. And he asked me, do you have any hobbies? And I just started riding horses. And I said, well, my goodness, I do. So I told him, oh, I just started riding horses. And he said, 
oh, I train horses. I was like, that's wonderful. Um, it's lovely to meet you. I've got to go. And I left. And that was the end of it. And then my, my boss showed up and talked to him. And a few days later, I received a fax from Haysom inviting me to his horse clinic. Wow. And it's all back. <laughs> it's, all, uh, now, it's all history from there. History from there. This guy is amazing. He, he, has, he has had uh, uh, businesses in Switzerland, Germany, uh, and then you came back to the United States. Uh, it, 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 it boggles my mind, the training and the places you've been and the things you have done. But when you guys met, you were still Muslim, right? I was still a Muslim. Okay, what, take me from that place, because this testimony yeah. is Can like... Can I ask something really quick, though, first? Yeah. Weren't you a little afraid to get close to someone that doesn't believe the same as you? Well, um, yes. And I did tell him that his religion freaked me out. And we had a discussion about it. <laughs> and my family members... Um, my family members are not saved, they're not believers, but that they're believers, if that makes yeah. sense. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, they were all of a sudden throwing scriptures at me about being unequally yoked and, yeah. and yeah. things that came out of them that... They never, you never knew they, they knew. Did, right, and yeah. they only knew because all of a sudden they were scared. Yeah. And they ran right. to their priest or their pastors, yeah. wherever they were. And yes, the Bible says that you shouldn't be unequally yoked, but God didn't say he's going to leave me. Um, and so, um, and I explained that to them. And I had peace. I had such peace. I prayed um, one day, and the Lord told me it's never going, for, for hasten salvation, and he said, it's never going to come from you. Zip it. Wow. Really? He did. I, and I thought, okay. I'm wow. Italian, so I'm very loud, and I yeah. give my opinion. Yeah. And so, um, and I did. I, I, I never challenged him. We would have great conversations about the Bible. So you obeyed the Lord. I obeyed him. And I was, I never battered Hazem with verses or scriptures or told him, I just, I zipped it. You just slid for the Lord in front of him. I did. It which the Bible talks about. It does. Yes. What did you, how did that affect you? Now go from there. Well, she was living the, the perfect example. We, we cannot judge each other, but we could be fruit inspectors. And the fruit of her spirit was always good. Mm -hmm. She was never challenging. She was never, uh, she never showed me lack of respect. I never showed her lack of respect at all because for me, respect is very important in any, any relationship, let alone a marriage. Correct. And uh, I never used her as the, the, the end of the joke or the other way around. I always showed her the, the love as in my spirit, I felt correct. And as uh, then as a Muslim, as Allah commanded me thinking this is the only way. I never once tried to convert her, nor to say, let's go to, I need you to come with me to the mosque, or any of that. I was devoted. I memorized the entire Quran as a teenager. Oh, my goodness. By heart. Oh, my goodness. So I was the devoted. The entire Quran. The entire Quran, cover to cover. I, and then that added more into my dilemma, because there is a lot of contradiction in the Quran. So I thought, let's study the Hadith, which is everything narrated, said, and behaved by his messenger, Muhammad. And that added more confusion because nothing made sense. So because of the fear of Islam, what I decided is I'm going to just follow Islam. I'm just going to conceal it and leave it in. And nobody should know where I stand as far as my relationship with my creator is mine and nobody else's. So not even my closest friend knew I was a Muslim. Only maybe a handful of people around me knew I was a Muslim. I prayed five times a day, even at the top of my work, traveling around the world. I will take five minutes. Uh, every time there is a prayer, pray in my closet and come out and nobody would know where I was or what I was doing. They would think I was reading something or whatever until I, I had uh, in 2014, when we came back from Switzerland, we were supposed to be here for a short period of time to see my other kids. And things went from worse to even worse, a more worse situation where you think, OK, where is the end of this? And You're talking about your ex-wife was my fighting, ex -wife letting you fighting, see the children. Yes. yes. And so when I was driving from Michigan to Ohio, where we were staying with my in-laws, I had a lot of pain in my head. And 
my wife, when I, I remember vividly, I told her I have a lot of pain. She said, well, stop, you know, and I'll come and pick you up. Of course, we husband don't listen to our wives all the time. I mean, sure. Why should we claim other wives? So sure. I drove to Ohio. <coughs> when I got there, I, I went to kiss my, my two boys goodnight, and I felt shadow in front, like a cloud in front of my left eye. So I told her, she said, honey, I'm a podiatrist. When it comes to your eyes, you're on your own. You need to go <laughs> yeah. to the hospital. You're a podiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> I can't fix your eye. <laughs> can't fix your eye. Uh, so the following day, I went to the doctor, and they said, I have a, retin uh, I have a stroke in the left eye. Mm. And the vision may go wrong uh, a little bit, but then they will fix it afterwards. It was Labor Day weekend. By the weekend, by Saturday, I lost total vision in my left eye. Total? Totally. So Tuesday, I went back to the doctor. And they said, no, you have a, a, a shingle virus in the optic nerve. So it consumed my entire eye, everything inside. Destroyed it. Destroyed yeah. it totally on the left side. So it was a shingle virus. It yes. was a shingle virus in the left eye, but it traveled backward to the brain, which is what the first hospital said, mm -hmm. and it's eating my brain. So the doctor, being so smart, came over and she said, if he's experienced inability to speak correctly or thought or whatever, it's normal. I said, well, great. You told me what's normal now. You go and do your job, and I do mine. Now, now, now they didn't. Ex you don't live through this, right? Is basically what she was saying. Yeah. 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 She said, "You're not going to live through this. All the statistics are against yeah. you." And then so she you, comes you, back. So you informed her. Yeah. That's what your statistics uh, say. But you do what you're supposed to do, and I do what I what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. And she said, "Well, I know what my job is. What's yours?" I said, "Praying." So she went away for 40 minutes and came back, and she was rubbing her head like this, and she said, we're going to transfer you to another hospital. So they transferred me by ambulance to U of M. To where? To uh, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh -huh. Because Kellogg's Eye Center was dealing with my eye issue anyway. When I got there, I asked the doctor to do all the tests all over again, and he said, your kidney, your liver, all shutting down. I don't think you're going to be until the morning, and if you are, we have to induce a coma and you may end up being vegetable because I believe the, the, the virus has traveled backward to the brain and eating the brain. And that's when I, just after midnight, I asked them, I was wired to more wires than you need to run an entire city. So I said, you can monitor me without anybody bothering me, leave me, be, leave me alone. And they left the hospital, the, the, my room, and then the light came on and you think, oh, it's a nurse or a doctor, they can't leave you alone for five minutes. And the light was so strong, and I opened my, um, the, my, my right eye, and I was thinking, what is this light? It's so strong and so, so focused on me. And I, and I hear, first of all, I felt a, a hand touching my heart, and he said, you're not done here yet. I've got so much work for you to do. Because I was praying for Allah to take me. I, I was done. I've been in control for 50 years of my life. I'm not going to end up a vegetable for my young wife and give her the, ha the agony of uh, life between hospital and home mm -hmm. with the two kids. I'd rather go and say goodbye. Mm -hmm. So I was praying really hard for Allah to take me. And the deception of Islam, I was thinking, how, what am I going to tell Allah when I meet him to intercede for my wife so she can come to heaven? Thinking I was going to heaven. And I was going nowhere near heaven, I can tell you that. So, the, wha so what I, was the light? The, 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 first of all, I felt a hand touching my heart and telling me, you're not done here yet. I've got so much work for you to do. Was it an audible? A, audible voice, like you and I talking now. And I thought for a second, I'm dead. I'm in heaven. They put me to work immediately. <laughs> <laughs> you have no grace. Sure. And I said, who are you? He said, I'm Yeshua HaMashayikh of Nazareth. Say that again. Yeshua HaMashayikh of Nazareth. Of what? Of, of Nazareth. Nazareth. Okay. And I thought, what? He said, I am that I am. I am the Alpha. I'm the Omega. I've known you and fashioned you before you were born in your mother's womb. I loved you before you were even born wow. and formed. And I thought, you've got zip code wrong here, buddy. Because <laughs> what is the Messiah doing on my bedside? Where is Muhammad? But that was my thought, and he was able to read into my thought, funny enough. Yeah. And he said, Muhammad is dead. I am the living God. Okay. But hold on a second. In the Quran, it says in chapter 4, 157, you are not killed, you are not crucified. It was made to believe. What kind of an aloof creator give you deity and take it away 600 years later? 
He explained to me his deity, why he had to die on the cross. Audibly? Audibly. I would see, I was able to have an encounter with him, seeing him like I'm seeing you now. Figure everything, the whole thing, a person standing next to me. We talked for quite some time. He explained the deity, he explained why he had to die on the cross, that no need for sacrifice, the goat, the calf, the, the, the camel, the, the, whatever it is that you're doing, it, nothing is going to make you righteous. Nothing, nothing is going to cleanse you from your sins except the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God and why he had died on the cross, defeated the grave, how he went down under to, to hell, bound the demon in hell and darkness and the kingdom of darkness and then resurrected to life. So every, he said, every one of you in, a, in, in your mind, you, ascend, you, you, you climb up the mountain or climb up the ladder to success. I had to go down to my success because he was a king of kings. He still is. But he had to go down to the grave, down under, mm -hmm. to hell and darkness, to free us all, defeat death, and come out victorious, and claim all human mankind for him. So what did you think when he, <coughs> while he's talking to you? I kept death? on challenging him. I couldn't challenge him. Everything he told me panned out. But so you knew the Quran and you were challenging him? I was telling him verse after verse, and he was telling me, but this contradicts this. And if you check everything, it felt right. I declared him as my Lord and Savior to himself directly. Right there? Right there. Now, if I died that moment, my wife would have thought I died as a Muslim. She wouldn't have known. But the following day, I was sitting up instead of laying down and unable to move. And two days later, I was out of the hospital on my own two feet. And no you were medicine. supposed to die? I was supposed to be dead or a coma. That's the power of God. When you met him after all of this, what was the next day? Yeah, it was in the morning, yeah. He didn't tell me the doctors told him that he may not make it. Okay. He said, you just go home with the boys <clears throat> and... I had an agenda. And um, <laughs> I'm going to go to the hospital and you come in the morning. So you so figured... You were, so you were at death's door. You really... I was yes, literally... you were right there. Yes, I was, was yes. Uh, so you had accepted opened. death. Yes, you I've did. accepted death. I was calling for it. Uh, the door was open and yeah. my feet were inside. Wow. Absolutely. Now you come in. I come in it, and it's normal. I didn't know any difference. And you're, you're, you're just thinking it's, it's, it's yes. so what did you tell her? Nothing. I didn't tell her. What am I going to tell her? Honey, by the way, I'm a Christian now. <laughs> and Jesus, <laughs> yeah, was, and Jesus was here. <laughs> but I had, even at the age of 50, I still had the same fear as a five-year-old when I used to question the Quran to my, my dad or my grandfather and they beat the bejesus out of you. Oh. Yeah. There was no mercy because they felt that you can never discuss or criticize or, or mm -hmm. question the authority of the Quran and Muhammad. So at the age of 50, I was still afraid. What if, I, what, what if I'm wrong? Mm -hmm. Having experienced his feeling, his touch, his word, his voice, his presence, the miracle of me being alive, I was still afraid at the age of 50 as I was when I was five. The, Age has no difference, yeah. no value when it comes to fear. True. Yeah. You can have an 80-year-old more afraid than a 5-year-old wow. and vice versa. Okay, we have five minutes because I don't want to miss any of this. Take me from this conversion to your life because you, you were afraid that you would be taken out by, by Allah. the Muslims. By the Muslim, by Allah. So I did my research and my research showed everything Jesus told me on my deathbed 100% correct. From all avenue, whichever one I did was correct. So I thought, let me try now and discuss and research the Quran the way I know it. And suddenly, for the first time, the stupor spirit, the blinder went off. Wow. I lost my physical eye, but God gave me 50 spiritual eye or more. Because I was able to see the, the discrepancies, the contradiction in the Quran for what it is. I was able to see the deception of the Quran and the message of Muhammad and the whole Islamic message for what it is for the first time ever in my life without the fear of what consequences is going to follow. Mm -hmm. I didn't care what Muslims are going to, going to do for me. I received a lot of threats, a lot of things. I didn't care. But that's why I wrote my book in a pen name. You know, see, on the cover I there's a pen name and, and it's, you're, you're saying I don't match his name. That's a pen name. And when I was reading the book, because his wife's name is Lori, there's a, another pen name in there <laughs> to cover her for protection. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, now, wait a minute. I know about his ex-wife. 
He was married again, and I'm looking at my format. It says Lori is his wife. That's not the name now, in the book. Lori, when did you discover that he was a different person? It was a few weeks later, he told me, but he was still praying the same way. So I said, Lord, what? what is this? Is he really? Because I'd prayed for seven years for him. He didn't know. I never told him. Yeah. And I thought, okay, so he says this, but he's still praying. What's going on? I, and so it wasn't like, yay. I, I thought I would be jumping for joy when he told me those words and because he was still praying. So I, I asked the Lord. I said, Lord, why is he praying? He said, Lord, you don't know what he's praying. I said, you're right. Within a week, within days, he was looking around like this when he would get ready to pray to see if somebody was watching him. And he just ever so slightly five degrees this way, he shifted his position. Wow. And then before you knew it, through that week, he was all the way around. And then he was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to pray. You Christians are... are are loose with your prayers. <laughs> your part-time you know? are expecting full benefit. <laughs> so he, he had a lot, a lot to come through. Wow. Mm -hmm. that, so when you give your testimony, this has happened to other Muslims, right? They have seen a vision. They have yeah. seen visions or dreams. Uh, I've known many, many Muslim that have seen dreams. I have 10 missions around the world, Muslim worlds that I feed into information, resources, and everything else. We have seen hundreds, if not thousands, of Muslims turn to Christ. And what's happening in the Middle East now is actually a bonus because every non-Christian non is a pre-Christian. The way Muslims look at you, you're a potentially either an infidel, which should be dead, or a Muslim. I look at everybody as a pre-Christian if they're not already a Christian because that's the message from Christ. That's the mandate that we're supposed to follow. Are you, are you ever fearful of your life? No, because I have a one ticket to heaven, I, eternal life. I can pull it out any time. Are that's you right. concerned for Lori? No, because God is going to take care of her and okay. going to take care of us. That's why I used pen name before, but recently in the last three, four months, the Lord revealed to me that you don't need a pen name anymore. I'm going to go before you. I'm going to pave the way. I'm going to concede you when you need to be conceded. I'm going to put you on a, on a platform when you need to be on a platform. So I trust the Lord with everything I have. What am wow. I going to worry about? But wow. with That's Sharia right. law. Sharia, but Sharia yeah. law. With Sharia law, there is a danger because if they, they get yeah. him, it's a free ticket to heaven. Yeah. But they don't go after him. They would go after the family first. Yeah. Yeah. Because then if they have your family, then most likely he's going to return. Wow. Uh, uh, Linda, c can you have them back? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because uh, I, I want to have a second part. Okay? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and he'll be walking in and riding horses. So. <laughs> he'll ride the <laughs> horses. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but seriously, uh, but get your copy. I mean, th this is mesmerizing. <laughs> it, it, yeah. it really is. And it just reinforces mm -hmm. the power and the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. He is the answer to every need you may have. Amen. God bless. Amen. Bye -bye. Amen.